Okay, hello everyone. Um, thanks, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm Nyla Khan and I, uh, I, I run the RBS Innovation Gateway with um, our colleagues at RBS quite closely. And um, I've got with me today um, uh, the pleasure to, um, uh, to introduce to you Douglas Crawford Brown, or should that be Dr. Douglas Crawford Brown, um, who's uh, the Director of the Centre for Climate Change Mitigation Research at the University of Cambridge. Um, today's session is all about um, demonstrating your innovation sustainability credentials, um, uh, uh, your innovation um, submission to RBS in, uh, through your conversations with our colleagues at RBS. Um, and as part of what we offer through the Gateway, we want to continue to support you with, uh, with um, valuable expertise and knowledge and, and best practice. And this workshop is um, one of those uh, such opportunities. So I hope you find it useful. Um, I'm going to keep this short just to say that if you have any problems, um, technically if you can't see the slides or if you can't hear anything, I'm on the end of the, the, um, the chat box. So on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see some options to, um, to speak to me. So my name is, uh, I, I'm, uh, dis I display as the RBS Innovation Gateway, but it's actually me managing that. So if you have any problems, just send me a message and I'll, I'll help you to uh, get back onto the recording or help you with any issues that you're having. Um, I'm going to leave it at that and I'm going to hand over now to, uh, to Doug. Um, actually, final thing I should say is that we will do a Q&A at the end and uh, you, uh, I'll be asking you to send your questions through the chat box to me um, and then I can put them to Doug at the end. So uh, I hope you enjoy the session. Uh, Doug, over to you. Okay, thanks, Nyla. Um, I mean, I hope that everybody can can hear this. For some reason, the um, the the students who are listening to it here at the University of Cambridge, uh, when they downloaded the system, aren't getting any sound over the over the speakers. So, you know, who knows what's going on there? Um, I can hear you loud and clear, and I think other people. Um, that I'm speaking to in the, in the chat can hear as well. Um, I'll try and investigate in the background, but um, okay. Yeah. So, uh, Doug, if you can uh, try and just speak clearly so that there's no background noise coming through, I think that should be great. Okay, that will be fine. And is the volume okay in, in the way I'm speaking now? A uh, couple of comments through uh, Mark Chadwick and a few others saying that they can hear you perfectly and they can hear okay. Okay. That's okay. Um, okay, and also, Nyla, I'm, I'm not sure on the slides since they're loaded onto um, WebEx, can I advance yeah. them now? You should be able to now, so feel free to go ahead and, and try. Okay, because uh, it's not advancing for me right now. Um, if you click okay. on this. Okay, this is, not, this is not working the way it usually does. Um, and uh, so I. So at the, so at the top of the slide, there's an arrow that's back and forth, Doug. Um, aha! Okay, yes. I'll use that, that arrow there. Okay, well, um, uh, sorry, somebody's running back and forth looking at the speakers here uh, for a second. Uh, any, any luck on that? Oh, did the slide change? Oh, sorry, um, everybody. Um, we're having problems on our end here. Uh, so I, I tell you what, give give me ten seconds to tell somebody something, and then and we'll be then we'll be off and running. Just a second. So just to let you know, in the meantime, we're hoping to have just uh, about thirty minutes, thirty to forty minute presentation from Doug, and then we've got about twenty minutes to have questions at the end. Um, so uh, anything that, that uh, you want to ask, Doug. Um, I'm glad that um, lots of people are sending through messages to say that they can hear loud and clear. Um, if you're having any problems, like I say, just let me know and I'll, I'll try and investigate while Doug's doing the presentation. Um, this is um, a similar presentation to the workshop that Doug led at the Right, RBS. okay. Yeah, I apologize to everybody here. For some reason, we're having a catastrophic failure on our end in the other room there. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, okay, so uh, as was mentioned, this is Doug Crawford Brown. You're, you're welcome to contact me um, on any of the issues that come up in today's presentation. Uh, for those of you who attended the one down in London, 
it's not so different to that one. It's just a little bit shorter minus the length of time that I was fooling around with the students in the other room here. So we're going to have four parts to this. Um, one is the, the science of sustainability. One is going to be the uh, technological and social barriers to sustainability and taking a look at how your innovations might be over, able to overcome those. One is going to be explaining your sustainability credentials, which is really the, the big thing for today. And then finally, I'll give a bit of a summary of, of six or seven major points or major steps that you would have to go through in order to uh, make your sustainability pitch. Um, so I, I'm first going to start with this one, the science behind sustainability of buildings and business operations. I'm only going to look at sustainability of buildings and business operations. There are lots of other issues of sustainability. It simply is that the RBS proposition in Innovation Gateway is one that's focused on buildings and, and business operations. So while I might also talk about sustainability of transport or air flight or something like that, um, uh, that would not be relevant to the, uh, the RBS Innovation Gateway. So I'll I'll just talk about the uh, buildings and business operations. Um, I'll, I'll start with this idea that there's a, a myth that sustainability has absolutely no meaning whatsoever. Um, this is an article that was uh, appearing in the BBC, which suggested that sustainability was one of the newest government phrases that uh, eventually um, is, is going to be uh, gotten rid of because it didn't have any meaning whatsoever. Uh, sustainability does have some meaning, as we'll see in just a bit. But as it says in the next slide, um, uh, there's some danger. Okay, there's some danger in having uh, too many ideas piled on. So if you look at the the UK government, at least back when we had regional governments, uh, listing of sustainability indicators, there are some 160 of these things. And by the time you get done piling all of these meanings of sustainability or indicators of sustainability on, you've basically got nothing other than a list of what it means to create a good city. And so as a result, I'm going to focus here on a very particular subset of sustainability uh, indicators. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the idea that sustainability is, is different to what I might call environmental protection. So in environmental protection, we're interested in the, the quality of the environment, the quality of the air, the quality of the soil, the quality of water, and so forth. In sustainability, we don't start with the environmental quality. We start with what it is that humans need. Humans need food, they need warmth, they need jobs, and so forth. And therefore, sustainability is going to be all about how does RBS meet these human needs while, as I show on the next slide, um, staying within certain material and energy resource requirements and assimilative capacity. So material and energy resource requirements simply means that if you're taking any particular material or energy, there may be a limitation to the amount of it, the amount of oil, the amount of water, the amount of solar radiation, and so forth. And if you're extracting more out or taking it out at a faster rate than it's being replenished, it's going to go down. This is not anything more complicated than a bathtub problem. Water goes in faster than it comes out, then you're going to have the amount of water in the bathtub going down. But in addition, we talk about the assimilative capacity. This is the ability of various parts of the environment such as the atmosphere, to absorb a certain amount of pollutant without adversely influencing human or ecosystem health and so forth. And therefore, we're interested in sustainability in what is it that your innovation is doing to material and energy resources in the environment and the use of those in RBS. What is your innovation doing to the ability of RBS to be able to meet the assimilative capacity of the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and, and so forth. So those are our two big things, material and energy resources, and then assimilative capacity. The metrics that might be used for sustainability, I've given you just here three of them, carbon, water, and energy. And the only reason I'm showing you this slide is, is or the only reasons are two things. One is the left-hand figure that's there. And the idea here is that any sort of economic system, which in this case would be RBS and all of its clients and so forth, uses inputs from the environment. It, those are the inputs on the left. It puts out waste. That waste is going to influence the quality of the environment. That's going to influence human health. But at the same time, because RBS is part of the economic system, I'm assuming that my pointer is, is showing on this, maybe not, because it's part of the economic system, it is also providing good features to the economy, 
raising wealth, raising GDP, raising human health, and, and so forth. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how is it that your innovation can improve the buildings and the infrastructure of RBS so that they use the minimum amount of inputs so that you get to the resource issue that I talked about a moment ago, produce the minimum amount of waste, which then gets at the issue of the assimilative capacity, while also producing the desirable economic activities that RBS is, is trying to get at. And then on the right-hand side, what I've done is raise the, one of the central questions in sustainability, which is what, what are the units? Are we going to, if we talk about carbon, for example, are we going to talk about tons of CO2 per year? Are we going to talk about tons of CO2 produced per pound of economic activity in RBS, tons of CO2 per square meter of RBS buildings, and so on? And as a result, RBS, as we'll see later on, is going to be, like all clients, interested in not just what the amount of carbon reduction is going to be, but how effective is that per pound of of economic activity in, in RBS, um, how does RBS compare to other similar enterprises, not in terms of total tons of CO2 emitted, but in terms of tons of CO2 per square meter of floor area, and so on. So for all the metrics that we might talk about, there is the total tons of that, or megaliters of water, or what have you. There's the tons per pound of economic activity, and there's the tons per square meter per year for for that particular metric. And uh, if you've dealt much in the carbon area, and I could talk about the same thing for water and, and wood and biodiversity and so forth, I can talk about three different scopes. I can talk about a scope one, which is where RBS is directly, for example, making use of energy, perhaps natural gas coming into the RBS buildings and um, uh, producing CO2. I can talk about scope two, which is a case where RBS is driving the demand for something such as electricity, but doesn't in the end control the production of that electricity. RBS is not EDF, it's not EON and so forth. And therefore, while your innovation might help RBS reduce the amount of electricity that it's going to consume, um, uh, it's not going to be able to change necessarily what the emissions factor is, how much CO2 is produced per kilowatt hour back at the EDF facility, the EON facility, and so forth. So scope one, things that they directly control, they control their natural gas, they control the boiler in their, in their building. Scope two, they control their demand, but they don't control the production. And then scope three, are indirect impacts, which might include, for example, the impacts of their clients when they come to RBS and leave RBS. It might include the paper and the, and the building materials and the desks and computers and so forth that are being purchased. Scope one and scope two are always going to be of interest to an organization. Scope three is of interest to RBS and to organizations like RBS, um, but it's really scope one and scope two that are the first ones from a business perspective anyway that one has to focus on in making the sustainability case. In the next slide, I, I'm showing you simply an output from something that in London we walked through when we did this live. This is a spreadsheet model that allows an organization like RBS to calculate their carbon footprint. So here I'm only going to talk about carbon. I could be talking about water. I could be talking about wood and so forth. Carbon is the, just the example I'll use. So the example I'm going to use here is from one of the buildings here in Cambridge. I'm not going to say it's not an RBS building. Um, in fact, it's not a banking building whatsoever. Um, but it's a building that consumes um, roughly, what does that say? That says 380,000 kilowatt hours per year of electricity. And notice that if one goes from the left-hand side of this figure, 380 kilowatt hours per year, um, then one is able to estimate the tons of CO2 per year, which is the yellow column, the second column from the left, and you get that by multiplying the amount of kilowatt hours per year in the building times the emissions factor that you see up top there right above it, 0 0.000537. And so from just electricity consumption, this building is, is producing about 204 uh, tons of CO2 per year. Now on the right-hand side, what I've done is I've shown what percentage of the electricity is going in for this building is going into cooling, computing, 
hot water, and so forth. And then I've got another blue column, which is talking about how much reduction one gets if some sort of innovation is applied. An insulator is brought in, uh, some sort of a voltage optimizer is brought in, what have you. And so if you look at this sheet here, the important thing for your sustainability story is, of course, what are the three things that you're able to influence? Are you able to influence the emissions factor for RBS? For example, maybe what you're doing is you're bringing in a low carbon source of electricity for an RBS building, and that reduces the emissions factor. Are you able to give them a better estimate of the percentage of their energy that's going into cooling, um, uh, uh, computing and so forth, because the numbers that you see in this second blue column uh, with the can you improve this estimate arrow pointing towards it, uh, those numbers are taken from natural averages, and, and therefore they may not be applicable to a particular building. And if you misunderstand or if RBS misunderstands what percentage of their electricity is going into catering versus computing and so forth, they may incorrectly allocate out the sources for reduction. And then finally, Finally, the big column is your innovation here. How much would your innovation, if it were put onto an RBS building, reduce the amount of energy consumed in catering, in computing, and so on, right? And so if you have all three of these arrows uh, well specified in a, a presentation to RBS, then what you're able to do is you're able to say exactly what it is that is caused, um, uh, how much reduction there is in the yellow box that you see at the bottom left, which says 204 tons of CO2 per year. So um, granny's sucking eggs on, on, on this issue here, but I think it's quite clear that what you're trying to do is you're trying to demonstrate the RBS not only are you reducing that 204 tons per year, but you know exactly how you're doing it. You know, what is it you're doing to the emissions factor? What are you doing to the percentage energy consumed? What are you doing to the um, amount of energy consumed in cooling, computing, and so on? And that then, the, this kind of a calculation always results in a carbon footprint, a water footprint, a wood footprint, take your choice, uh, whichever one you're looking at. This is the one for the particular building that I'm talking about um, here in Cambridge. Notice that it's got a very high amount of CO2 from electricity, uh, a lower amount from natural gas. Uh, the third one is fleet. Um, the fourth one in height is office devices. That's because in this particular year, they bought several hundred computers for this building and so forth. And so what you're trying to give um, uh, the client a sense of is which of these bars, perhaps all of them, but which of these bars are being reduced and by how much are they being reduced. And what you're trying to convince them of is, look, I'm, I'm talking about reducing electricity. I'm not talking about reducing, oh, I'll take something here, travel, right, where travel is not, in this case, is not a very large bar, therefore is not that significant in the overall carbon footprint for the building. Now, let's move on from this to, uh, given that you've um, already provided RBS in the previous set of slides, the amount of reduction that will occur in their energy use, in their CO2, in their water use, and so forth. Now the question is, what sort of barriers are there to sustainability? Will your innovations be able to overcome these barriers that we find in essentially every um, uh, 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 sort of, uh, of innovation that's being pitched to, uh, to RBS. And we've got three technological challenges and three social challenges. The three technological challenges you'll see here are load leveling, overpromise under delivery, and stranded investments. So let's just go into those right now. Um, load leveling is where a company, an organization, or whatever, um, uses different amounts of energy in different parts of the year. The classic one is heat. So here's a typical building um, here in Cambridge. This building is not using much heat at all in June and July. It's using a lot of heat in January and February. This is really difficult to uh, be able to bring in low carbon energy when you've got a scenario like this. And as a result, particularly big companies like EDF, EON, the energy generators, they would like to level this out. They would like to be able to have roughly constant heat being demanded in every month because it makes their energy system more efficient. It makes it 
operate more efficiently. It makes the emissions factor that I spoke about earlier, tons of CO2 per kilowatt hour, lower. And so if you are able to bring an innovation in, which doesn't simply produce reductions necessarily in, in energy consumption, uh, but is able to level the load for RBS and particularly to level the load for other community connections that might be in RBS. So, for example, other buildings that are connected to RBS's buildings and might use the waste heat. If you're able to do this load leveling, then that's a significant improvement on the overall efficiency. So, so that's a technological hurdle, trying to get an innovation which is helping with load leveling in energy consumption. The second one is overpromise and underdelivery. Uh, the, the innovation field in low carbon anyway is filled up with promises of how much reduction one is going to get, how long the product is going to last, and so forth. Um, and if you look at things like insulation, for example, insulation in buildings typically lasts eight years, nine years, although it's being sold to last 20 years. If, the, if RBS has developed a business case for applying something like insulation, and the only way they get back their investment is if the installation, insulation stays in place for, let's say, 20 years, and it turns out that the insulation only lasts for eight years, they may never get the payback period reached for their, uh, for their expenditure, for their CapEx expenditure. As a result, what you're trying to also do in sustainability is to be able to show that your innovation, you have evidence that your innovation is going to last as long as you say that it will last when applied to a building because the business case may depend very critically on this. The, the final one uh, for technology is stranded investments. These are investments where the, 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 the clients, such as RBS, has put something onto their building, they think that it's the latest thing, it's going to be around for a long time, maybe it's solar panels, for example, and then a new technology has come along to displace it before the application has reached the end of its payback period. So we would refer to these normally as stranded assets. Now you've got a building that's sitting there with some investment, for example, solar panels on the roof, before it reaches its payback period, a new solar panel comes along that is much more efficient. You have to tear the old solar panels out. You've got to put the new solar panels in. And so there's a danger that what you'll have is an investment, an asset, which simply hasn't reached the end of its payback period and is therefore uh, stranded. What I found interesting, and you can see this in the italics at the bottom, is that th this is a, a paper that was produced for the government, and it doesn't mention technology change as one of the reasons for stranded assets. It mentions environmental challenges. You've got an asset, you've done something to it, and um, uh, some sort of innovation has been put on, and it's producing too much CO2, it's using too much water or something like that. Um, the resources, you think you've got enough natural gas to be able to use your system for 20 years, turns out you're going to run out of natural gas. A new government regulation comes along and suddenly makes your, your higher carbon um, investment less um, uh, reliable or, or less desirable than would otherwise be the case. What's not listed here is technology change. If you think about mobile phones, they, they change every couple of years. And, and therefore, if you've got a payback period, which is going to require five years of payback, and the technology is simply changing too rapidly, and it's only going to be around for a year or two years, then what you've got is stranded assets. And you see that all the time when you look at the mountains of mobile phones that we have going into our landfill sites right now. So those are technology um, uh, barriers. We then have three social challenges, the technology diffusion ladder, the rebound effect, and people behaving badly. And so let's take a look first at the technology diffusion ladder. The idea of the technology diffusion ladder is that there are some people who are innovators. Now, I don't mean innovators like those of you on the, on the call here. Um, I mean innovators in the sense that these are people who always have to have the latest innovation. If a brand new phone comes along, by God, they've got to have that thing immediately. They're the ones who are spending three days in front of the, uh, the Apple store to get the latest uh, iPhone each time it comes out. Innovators will grab new technologies. 
Then there are opinion leaders. Opinion leaders, which is a larger percentage of the population, will only grab a technology once the innovators have gotten it past the sort of valley of death. The innovators have worked out the bugs, let's say, of the system. But opinion leaders do want to move along on adopting a technology. And RBS in this case is, I would say it's an opinion leader in that case. You and others who are innovators might be the ones who who get it up to the point where the opinion leaders are going to grab hold. But then you start getting into people, let's take laggards, for example. Laggards, it just doesn't matter what you do with a technology, they don't want it. They've always done whatever granddad did, and, you know, they're not interested in a, in a brand new technology. And so one of the things that you're going to be interested in in, in in pitching to a group like RBS is which parts of the ladder is your innovation going to affect? So the example that's always used is when the government first tested in-home displays of energy use, they did a non-random sample. They gave the, the devices to people that you would call innovators. Those innovators ended up having about a 14% reduction in their energy use. Then what happened, just because of the displays, then what happened was, DEC and others gave these things out more randomly, and when they gave them out more randomly, they were getting people now in the sample who are opinion leaders, early majority, late majority laggards, and what you found was a one or two, maybe in some cases, 3% reduction in energy use. And that's why uh, when you make the pitch, of course, what you're trying to show is that your innovation will be good not just for innovators, but it's going to be good at least for opinion leaders and early majority people here. The laggards, you just sort of give up on. You're, not, you're just not going to get them to, to come on board. So that's the technology diffusion ladder. The second technological hurdle is the rebound effect. You'll all have seen this before, uh, the Jevons paradox, however you want to refer to it here. Um, and that's the idea that every time we've developed something which brings greater energy efficiency historically, we've ended up using even more energy. And so the example here is something like an automobile. You make the automobile lower, uh, excuse me, less heavy so that you have less embodied energy, less embodied carbon. That produces lower running costs because it's less heavy. That causes you to drive further because you feel fine. Now you've got better gas mileage, so now I'm going to drive places I wouldn't have driven before. And you may end up with more energy being used. And so what you're trying to do is to pitch to the client that somehow your innovation is able to get around this problem of the rebound effect, that you understand the rebound effect, you understand why people might respond to your innovation by actually consuming more energy and producing more CO2, and you've got a way to get around that, that uh, problem of the rebound effect. And then finally, the third one is going to be people misbehaving. So this was a study that was done in the UK that looked at, in the red one, it looked at people turning lights off when they left a room. And uh, on the, uh, the x-axis is number of employees that you have in the room, and on the y-axis you have the, the percentage of lights that were turned off when nobody was in the room. And, and you have this sort of theoretical red curve, and the red curve was given to this particular organization by the organization that was pitching um, a, a strategy for occupant behavioral change. And the argument was, oh, with, with our innovation, you're going to get 100% of the lights turned off uh, whenever you've got more than two or three people in a room and they've now left the room. The blue line is what the actual experience was with it that you instead got 40 or 50% once you got the large numbers of employees in the room, you got to 40 or 50% of the time when the lights were turned off during periods when people were not in the room. So, so what you're looking at here is, are the lights turned off when there's nobody in the room at all? And, and again, you can see that there's a vast amount of overpromise, a lot of amount of under delivery. And the interesting example that's, that's shown here is that the more people there are who are, let's say, working in the room at any time during the day, the more likely it is that even when everybody leaves the room, uh, the lights stay on. And that's probably, as you might imagine, that's probably because everybody, every, each of the employees, all five of them, for example, assume that it's one of the other four employees who's responsible for turning off the lights. Okay, so can your innovation influence behavior in such a way that you don't have 
this gap here. This is, this is called the performance gap. Now, why do we care about these challenges? Again, we go back to the idea that RBS is putting money into uh, applying an innovation to a building. They are assuming that there will be some payback period. The payback period is the point at which that green line, which is the benefits, crosses the blue line. And if they have made this business case, assuming that there are no technological hurdles, no sociological hurdles, assuming that the green line is exactly what you see here and the blue line is exactly what you see here, but it turns out that the green line is not correct because of these hurdles, rebound effect, for example, and instead the green line is pushed downwards, then that means there's a longer payback period than they were anticipating. And if that payback period, as I said, happens to be longer than the length of time that the that the insulation or the new lights or whatever are going to be in place, then you never get to uh, the complete return on your investment. So the question here is, can you move that crossover point um, uh, further to the left, not to the right, but further to the left, which usually means either uh, in, in lowering the, uh, the costs or, or uh, raising the benefits. So we'll, we'll end with this, and then we'll have lots of time for questions and answers. Explaining the sustainability credential. So now you've, you've done number one. You're able to quantify carbon, water, whatever it is that's your proposition. You're able to show which bar has been reduced in the overall footprint for RBS. You're able to show why you can get past the technological hurdles, why you're able to solve some of the sociological hurdles for your innovation, and now you're going forward and you're, and you're making the pitch. Just a couple of, of quick points here. Um, it, given that these kinds of decisions at RBS, like any organization, are going to be made by people who are in the fiscal office ultimately, the environmental people will have a say, but the people in the fiscal office are, are going to need to see the business case, then what you need to be able to do is to help them make what I would call here an investment grade sustainability assessment. Um, this is for the building that I talked about earlier. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what this building is, um, but the per important point is as you go down this, uh, this listing, the set of columns, you start getting to calculations of what the cost effectiveness is. You get the calculations about the payback period, calculations about the reduction in the amount of CO2. And what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to provide these numbers with a certainty, as certain as you can get, a certainty that is good enough not just for an innovator, but is good enough for the hard-nosed financial officer of the organization who probably will be the one who ultimately has a say about whether that innovation is allowed on the building, particularly if it costs something up front to be able to put on the innovation. Um, item number B, helping RBS join its aspirant class for any um, metric of sustainability, an organization like RBS will have a kind of scale. Let's just say here the scale goes from 0 to 10. It doesn't matter what that scale is. We use this particular scale in a, in a program in Abu Dhabi, so well, I've just stolen the slide here. Zero means even with your innovation, uh, RBS is totally unsustainable. Ten, um, with your innovation, RBS is completely sustainable. So maybe zero is your, um, your um, uh, innovation is going to cause RBS to have 50 tons of CO2 per person per year. Uh, a 10 is going to mean your innovation is going to get RBS down to you know, 0.5 tons of CO2 per person per year. But then RBS will also have aspirant classes. They'll say, well, you know, I'd like to be kind of like B&Q or M&S or HSBC. Well, they're better than HSBC. Um, uh, I, I want to be like HSBC. And therefore, what they're going to want to know is, where will your innovation help us to move up this ladder? How will it move us from the bottom third of the league table, for example, of our aspirant class up to the top third of the aspirant class? So you know, I think this will be quite clear uh, what it is we're getting at in this particular slide. Then in one of the last slides, what is your criteria 
or what are the what is the criterion or what are the various criteria of assessment that you're going to use. So effectiveness is, again, just looking at carbon as the example, effectiveness is how many tons of CO2 per year did you just help RBS reduce or water or, or paper or whatever. So tons of CO2 per year. How efficient is it? How much CO2 did you get reduced per pound of expenditure? either as CapEx or OpEx or CodEx, so capital expenditure, operating expenditure, or total expenditure. Equity, how much CO2 per year did you reduce by the different actors in the organization? So an organization always has a lot of different actors, the people who are in charge of paper, the people who are in charge of the fleet, the people who are in charge of the energy consumption in the building, and has your innovation somehow helped to ensure that the people, the actors who really are most responsible for the CO2 are the ones who are influenced by your innovation. Acceptance, I, I think this will be quite clear, somebody's got to agree to put your innovation on and um, is there going to be social acceptance in that regard? If you've got an innovation that's going to require people to sit in 10 degrees buildings in the, in the winter time, acceptance level is, is likely not to be very high. Um, if you're simply making them go from 20 degrees down to 19 degrees, well, now you've got greater acceptance. And then finally, this is sort of the, the final point, um, harmonization. RBS, any organization, has a wide number of goals. They are interested in CO2. They're interested in energy efficiency. They're interested in their cost. They're interested in their, in their uh, reputation. They're, they're also doing other things within RBS that might not be related to your innovation, but where you need to make sure that your innovation is not getting in the way of, or I should say you're making sure that your innovation is synergistic with some of these other programs that RBS might have going on, which may have nothing whatsoever to do with sustainability, but may nonetheless be influenced by whatever sustainability thing you're proposing. So your question, the question in Alex is, how does your innovation balance these uh, various criteria? Don't just go in with effectiveness. Do all five if you possibly can. Okay? And then this last one, I'm not going to spend any time on it. Um, it is simply, are you bringing the numbers in? Are you not just coming in and saying, oh, you need a green wall, everybody's got a green wall. Are you coming in and saying, and here's exactly what your cost savings will be, what your CO2 reduction will be, and so forth. And equally importantly, as you see in italics, can you justify those numbers? The, the only thing university people are any good at is making you prove the things that you stated. So uh, just imagine me in the background constantly turning to you and saying, well, can you show me that? Can you actually justify your claim? And then we end with the last couple of slides being the idea that first you have to tick many different boxes um, in order to get your innovation across. Your client, or RBS in this case, might be interested in carbon reduction, they might be interested in reduced energy costs, in goods or services to sell, in supporting business growth, and so forth. If you're able to go in and show that you tick a lot of different boxes, now suddenly the person who's buying your innovation for sustainability is beginning to say, it looks like I've solved multiple things that are, I've gotten multiple problems off my desk, let's say, by accepting your, your innovation. And I end with this summary slide which is the steps to establishing your credentials. I'll let you read through them. I think they should be clear now from the presentation. Know what metrics are of interest to RBS. Doesn't do any good to pitch the idea that, that you're going to uh, re reduce their water if it turns out water is not actually an important part of the RBS environmental impacts. Show specifically where your innovations affect those metrics and tell us exactly what that number is going to be. Does it take the tons of CO2 per year and reduce it by 5%, 20%, 50%? Show how you avoid the technological traps and you avoid the social traps. Show RBS that you can help them move up, you can, you can make them just as good as M&S and, and so forth. Um, understand who it is that takes the decisions in RBS and what it is that they care about. It doesn't do much good to go in and pitch the idea that you reduce your carbon emissions if it turns out the person who's taking the decision is somebody in the fiscal office who only cares about annual spend on energy. You can 
reformulate your sustainability pitch as an, an energy savings pitch, a cost pitch, and then tick as many boxes as possible, rather than relying on the idea that the person that you're talking to is solely interested in sustainability. There's almost ne never anybody who's solely interested in sustainability. So I'll end with this by saying that, um, and I should be hearing cheers from the other room, um, uh, these uh, materials that I've been presenting from you are for you uh, have come from some discussions with the University of North Carolina summer program uh, students that we have here, and they've been helping the city of Cambridge move forward, the city council move forward on its sustainability planning. And uh, so I'll end and turn back over to Nyla and say thanks very much for uh, listening to this. I think I stayed within time. And so now I'm able to take any questions. Uh, what I will do is make the same offer that I made at the live uh, event down in London, which is if you want to send me your um, uh, your proposition and want me to look through it before it goes off to RBS, uh, feel free to do that. So, Nyla? Thanks so much, Doug. That's, um, that's great. That's really helpful. And um, just from some of the comments coming through in the chat box, it looks like people are, have found um, the presentation really useful so far. Um, and I think it was the same uh, it, at the workshop in person. Um, I've got uh, a few questions coming through, Doug. So if it's okay, I'm going to I'm going to put them to you now. Um, just so that everybody knows, um, there is a summary of this uh, of Doug's presentation and uh, a copy of his slides um, and the uh, the Excel that that you saw embedded in one of those slides there on the gateway. I'll send you all a link to it afterwards so that you've all got um, a copy of the notes and. and and uh, this recording will also be uploaded there so you can come back to any bits that you've missed or, or share it with any of your colleagues that you might want to. Um, and if anybody has any questions, again, just, just put, uh, put them to me uh, through the chat box on the right-hand side of the page. So let's, let's kick off with um, a couple of first questions. So, so Donald McRitchie has asked, um, uh, he says, solutions to buildings can't be considered uh, individually. So how do you measure their cumulative effect? Because obviously they interact with each other. Yeah, and uh, so there are some things about a building that don't interact much at all. So for example, my plug load in a building uh, for fans that are plugged in and, and, and computers and so forth may not have anything to do with what's going on in the building next to me. However, as far as EDF is concerned, they are interested in the interaction between the buildings because if it turns out that your building is using all of its power you know, from three to five in the afternoon and another building is using it all from one to three in the afternoon, then they are thinking about the load leveling aspects. But I think that actually what, what he's getting at here is the idea that particularly if you look at uh, district heating schemes, for example, um, you you cannot figure out what the impact is going to be on an individual building in terms of carbon emissions until you know whether that waste heat, for example, is going to be able to be distributed out to other people. And you may find that, uh, just as an extreme case, you may find that you put a CHP into your building and um, you, you think you're going to get a certain carbon savings, but you can't get anybody else in another building to take your waste heat, and therefore your CO2 emissions may actually be a lot higher than you anticipate, whereas if you could get rid of the waste heat and use it in other buildings, then the CO2 argument becomes stronger. Um, as a result, I, I, I completely agree with the idea that for, for a number of propositions that have to do with load leveling in communities, or at least at the level of a block in a city, um, you can't estimate those changes until you take a look um, at what the other buildings are that are connected to the building of interest. Having said that, when you go forward with your innovation, um, if you don't know how to answer that question, all I can say is at least the business officer is going to have a very hard time then figuring out exactly what the business case is for the, for the innovation. So I guess that's about all I, I can say on that one. Now. Okay. I've got another one here from, uh, from Gary Moore. So Gary's asking, he's saying, surely a stranded investment will still deliver the savings it's promised, even if it's been superseded and better technologies come along. What do you think, Doug? Uh, okay. Um, so so, uh, so y y you put in an innovation, 
and you are needing 10 years to pay it back, and in five years, a new innovation comes along and supplants your innovation. Now, I think the argument here from, uh, I guess it was Gary, I think, I think you said, Alan, um, yeah. the, ar the argument here is that, well, you don't necessarily have to get rid of the, the innovation. If you've got inefficient solar panels, you can still leave them on there, and you're therefore able to recover your, your, um, uh, your investment eventually. So if it turns out that somebody can leave your innovation in, even as new innovations come along, then I would agree that that's not a, um, uh, that's not a stranded asset. So my point about stranded assets should only be applied to cases in which when a new innovation comes along, it is disruptive. It, it gets rid of whatever the previous innovation was that, that was brought in. And you're right, that's not always the case, Barry. Sometimes your innovation can stay in place um, uh, even after a new technology has come along. But what we find in, again, like things like solar panels is that when new generations of solar panels have come along, people have often torn out the old ones and put in the, in the brand new ones because the business case works for them to, uh, to do that. Okay. Go ahead, Alex. I've got another one here from, from Dick Wallace. So Dick's asking if you can um, share your thoughts around structuring your first few pilot schemes for, for truly new products and services, so genuine new innovations. Um, and, and, and I guess the second part of his question is, how do you really incentivize employees to change, particularly in large organizations and public sector? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and, and given that I know Dick, I get, I get where he's coming from on this first point. Um, I, what he's getting at is the idea that some innovations are such game changers, game changers in the sense that they completely change the way in which we even think about the problem. Um, and because they're such game changers, you often can't calculate what the impact is going to be because all the things that that new innovation is going to depend upon aren't in place yet. Um, you know, maybe, for example, your innovation is not just bringing in low carbon energy into a system, but it's changing where people get their energy from. Now they're getting from tides or something like that. Uh, maybe it's changing the uh, manufacturing processes uh, for the manufacture of, of energy goods and so forth. And so there can be entire system changes that result from uh, uh, what looks like a relatively uh, a minor change in an, an innovation, and you can't pr predict that. Certainly an organization like RBS is, let's say, I I'm going to make this up, but um, I, I think they would agree. Um, they're not necessarily a group that is uh, interested in changing, uh, making the innovations that, that are game changers. Now, I, I know they would be if, if it were possible, but I think they would be more likely to say, you know what, I can't change society overall, I can change my buildings. You know? um, and so I, I would think it's, there are some organizations who would pitch a game changer to, uh, EDF, EON, a government or something like that. There are other organizations who are just in charge of their buildings where game changers may not be possible to pitch to them as important as a game changer is. Now, the, 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 the second, Lila, give me the second point again. I'm, I'm having a senior moment here. You there, Nyla? Yes, yes, I am. Okay. Um, what, what, what was the second part of this question? The second part of this question was, um, how do you really engage uh, ah, uh, yeah. employees to change, um, yeah. particularly in large organizations and in public sector? Okay, uh, 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 good, good question, Dick. Um, uh, direct it over to Nate here at the University of North Carolina students who are here. That's what he's dealing with. Uh, changing behavior of, of people in buildings is is really quite difficult to do. As much as we would like to be able to change the behavior, um, it is the most recalcitrant factor. Uh, and it's because uh, there are some people who will make changes in response to sustainability indicators, but the large majority of people won't make changes in response to it. As a result, the more your innovation is able to get beyond those social barriers that I spoke about and resolve them, the more likely it is that you're going to be able to 
um, to, uh, to make the changes that are needed. The one thing that we're finding, and Nate's report will be covering this, uh, the one thing that we're finding is you cannot just give people data in the building on their energy use and so forth. They simply don't respond to that, or they will respond for the first couple of months, and then they forget to look at it or don't look at it. What you've got to find is some way in which you are actively giving them feedback into their behaviors, and you're letting them know, sometimes in non-quantitative terms, how it is that their behavior is influencing the performance of the building. And so that's all I'll say on that, Nyla. Mm, okay. Thanks, Doug. Uh, I've got another question here from, from Nick Murray. Um, so Nick's saying uh, investment grade sustainability assessment is never going to achieve more than eco efficiency in short term investment. Companies that need to use uh, the companies need to use methods that uh, invest in their uh, their stakeholders' long term future and to incorporate incentives and mechanisms that achieve that long term investment. So uh, we'd like to get your thoughts on that, Doug, um, particularly things like marginal abatement curves and, and, and other methods that can be used. Okay. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Um, uh, when I said investment grade um, assessment, I don't mean that it is an assessment which is simply being done for investors. What I mean is if you're going to get investors involved, they require very high quality data to take their decisions, whereas non-investors often will operate on the, and sort of by the seat of their pants, and they'll, they'll live with a, you know, a factor of two error and so forth. So I'm not necessarily implying that an investment rate assessment is only taking into account the, uh, the investor side of things because you're absolutely right, Nick, that um, uh, investors will be driven by, by, by return on investment, right? And, and, and other kinds of, of reasons why we might do these sustainability innovations won't be captured by, uh, by an investor. So when I say investment grade, I really am pointing to, I could take out investment grade and just put really good numbers, really sound numbers. Um, marginal abatement cost curves are a variant of the investment grade um, numbers that I provided. So a marginal abatement cost curve is one that is basically the economic efficiency criterion that I spoke about earlier. But what's interesting about marginal abatement cost curves, um, and I would just direct people to Google if you know, want to see what those things are, is marginal abatement cost curves also help the, I'm going to call it the investor, but it doesn't have to be an investor. It could be a building manager. It causes them to think about what would you do first and those first things you do may have no cost whatsoever to them. They, they, they may have a negative cost. So, uh, for example, uh, turn, getting people to turn off lights doesn't cost you anything, and you immediately start getting a cost savings. And then what a marginal abatement cost curve will do is it will say, now go to the next thing. And the next thing is, um, I, I don't know, voltage optimization. And maybe voltage optimization is going to have a very quick payback period. And eventually, as you start marching from the left to the right in these marginal abatement cost curves, what what you're getting to are the innovations that are going to cost a lot more per ton of CO2 um, abated. And so um, if you do your investment grade assessment right, as the students are doing now for their, for their um, uh, Cambridge City Council, what they're doing is essentially marginal abatement cost curves. They're helping the client understand why you come up with your innovation because it is getting one of the first things on the left-hand side in the marginal abatement cost curve, and therefore, there might actually be no cost whatsoever. There might be a net savings um, in, in regard to the innovation. So that, that's about all I can say on that in, the, in such a short time. So Nyla? Okay, thanks. And um, I, I'm conscious of time. We've got just a couple of minutes left, so I've got a final question here. Um, again, this one's from Dick. So this one's about um, competition and how we can create healthy competition. So. So Dick's asking, across the 2,400 RBS branches, do you think there's some scope for some inter-branch competition in, in energy management to improve the overall group performance? Perhaps mm. there's a, an obvious answer to that, but um, uh, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on, on where you start with something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like that question because here in Cambridge for the Cambridge Retrofit Program, what we know is that we don't know an awful lot about what retrofit measures are actually going to work. And therefore, Cambridge Retrofit has been set up 
to try different kinds of retrofits in different buildings, with the idea being that they'll start to create a sort of experimental database. And therefore, there is some merit to thinking about RBS as having a bunch of different properties where you don't put the same innovation on every property, you put one innovation on 10 properties, another innovation on another 10 properties, and then you look downstream and see which ones have really delivered in the, uh, in the long run. So nice idea. Um, that's something RBS would have to decide, whether they want to treat themselves as a laboratory, let's say. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Doug. Um, on behalf of the, the RBS Innovation Gateway team, thanks once again for your time and your input. Um, I've got lots of um, lots of comments um, from from people saying Chris Chalice, Martin Jones saying it's been a really interesting presentation, excellent, very informative. So uh, thanks again for taking your time, and thank okay, you to everyone. Sorry, may I say that uh, on my last slide, notice it's got my email. Anybody can email me anytime, and I'll I'll reply back to them with a question. Yeah, and that's that's a great offer. So please, um, you know, feel free to take Doug up on that offer. Thanks again to everyone that's, that's logged in and taken time um, from your day to, to listen into the session. We hope it's been useful. Um, like I said at the beginning, uh, we'll be sharing a recording of this session, the slides and the Excel uh, on the gateway. Uh, I've got your email addresses and your name, so I'll send you all an email with a direct link to it to make it easier for you. Um, and keep your eye on the, out on the gateway for, uh, for more workshops and more sessions that we'll be doing online. And uh, thanks very much. Okay, Thanks, Doug. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye.